our agenda is fairly loose today, um, and uh, we may come back to committee this afternoon after the floor to do some work that is to be determined. Um, but for this morning, we will um, have a review of the constitutional amendment clarifying the prohibition of on slavery and indentured servitude. And um, and then you will have some time after that this morning to do some constituent service or, uh, I don't know, go get some balloons for your friend. Um, at any rate, friend, friend <laughs> do, you, do you have one? Do you have a friend? <laughs> If you have our cabaret sketch already. Oh, it's, yes. <laughs> it's a little early, though, to know exactly what's going to sure. stick, That's right? True. Some people need a lot of practice. Um, <laughs> ooh, look at that. Our phone is ringing. Somebody wants to say hello. They're going to turn the volume on. Oh, off on this, this um, unit? Well, go ahead and answer it since we're not actually started yet. Yeah, how do you that we did last April or May? Maybe it was. I don't know. Probably it was April. Hi. Good morning. Good morning. Sian Rask, Legislative Council. I'm reviewing with you Proposal 2 as passed the Senate that clarifies that slavery and indentured servitude in any form are prohibited. Um, let's just do a refresher though first about that constitutional amendment process. Thanks for mentioning it, Madam Chair. Um, we do have a document. You can find it right on your homepage. Here's your House Committee on GovOps homepage. If you do want to just have access to that constitutional amendment procedure doc, it's listed right on your home page under additional information, so you can just click on that. And there's a document that provides all the details for how to amend the Vermont Constitution. I won't go through all of it in detail, but the big picture is that constitutional amendments um, is a long process. It's two bienniums followed by a vote of the voters. So we're not even halfway through this process right now. Um, constitutional amendments have to start in the Senate and they can only be introduced every other biennium. So this is a biennium in which amendments can be proposed. And then it has to go to the House. And the House's options are to either <coughs> adopt it as is or not adopt it. The House cannot amend a constitutional amendment after it's left the Senate. It's essentially locked in. Um, Just to clarify that point, does the House have to act one way or the other so uh, it could, an amendment could get sent to committee and by inaction that would be the same as not adopted. That's correct. Okay. Um, the House is not required to take an up or down vote. Okay. So it's like any other piece of legislation that it could hang on your wall if this committee chooses not to pursue it. Okay. So it's either not take action or uh, approve it as is with the language as written. Um, the House rules do require that if you will consider a proposal, that there has to be a public hearing, and you did hold that public hearing last session. It was the after legislative hours uh, public hearing in room 11 that you held on the issue. And as the chair had stated, um, there is a longer notice period for when these um, constitutional amendments have to be on the notice calendar. Um, it's noticed for four legislative days and then action on the fifth legislative day. So that's where we are right now, your consideration of whether to vote the proposal out of committee um, as written by the Senate. So I'll actually go into the text of the amendment now. I do have an overview document posted here um, so that you can have an overview of the actual language itself and then some of the background on this issue. So I'm going to try to remember how to do this. Yay. Um, I'm doing it for her. <laughs> <laughs> the teacher. 
So here's the overview of the amendment itself. We've already taken a look at the Sean, um, amendment procedure. So what this proposal would do is amend the second half of our very first article of our Vermont Constitution, Chapter 1, Article 1, to clarify that slavery and indentured servitude in any form are prohibited, which is the constitutional law um, by the U.S. Constitution. You can see the language of this first chapter, this first article of our uh, Vermont Constitution uh, begins. <laughs> <laughs> no. Sorry about that. <laughs> so I'll back up. The language that's at issue in this Chapter 1, Article 1, currently reads that no person born in this country or brought over from sea ought to be holden by law to serve any person as a servant, slave, or apprentice. After arriving to the age of 21 years, unless bound by the person's own consent after arriving to that age, or bound by law for the payment of debts, damages, <coughs> fines, costs, or the like. So big picture, this proposal would strike that language and as a substitute say that slavery and indentured servitude in any form are prohibited. The way that this proposal is set up, it starts off with a section one purpose section. These have not always been provided in constitutional proposals, but more recently the legislature has been including these purpose sections um, for anyone going to look at the document to have a summary of what the purpose is supposed to do. But if this gets to the stage of going to the voters, the practice has not been to include that purpose section on the general election ballot. Mm -hmm. So right now, this purpose section um, is really for informational purposes now as it's moving through the legislative process. On the general election ballot, voters would only see the actual text of the section to be amended. But for the purpose, as stated in Proposal 2, it provides that this proposal would amend the Constitution of the State of Vermont to clarify that slavery and indentured servitude in any form are prohibited. Then Sec 2 goes into the actual text of that Article 1. Um, you can see that that language that we currently have in regard to slavery and indentured servitude would be repealed and in place that language, that explicit statement that slavery and indentured servitude in any form are prohibited. And then SEC 3 provides the effective date. This is the standard effective date for constitutional proposals. Um, it would be upon ratification by the voters of the 2022 general election. Um, it makes it through that process, which again requires concurrence by the House this session. And then next biennium, it would go back to the Senate, start over again. Um, it would have to be adopted in the exact same form that it leaves now. And then the House would again have to approve it. And then it would go to the voters, and if they approve it, this would be at the 2022 general election. This document then provides some background regarding this constitutional text here. Um, it's remained relatively unchanged since it was first added in our 1777 Vermont Constitution. That's Vermont's first constitution. Um, the first half of this article provides that people are born equally free and independent and have certain natural, inherent, and unalienable rights, which are enjoying and defending life and liberty, acquiring, possessing, and protecting property, <coughs> and pursuing and obtaining happiness and safety. The second half, then, of this Article 1 begins with therefore, which seems at least to indicate to me that the second half is of the article as a result of those rights that were just stated. It says right now, therefore, no person born in this country or brought over from sea ought to be holden by law to serve any person as a servant, slave, or apprentice after arriving to the age of 21 years unless bound by the person's own consent after arriving to such age, or bound by law for the payments of debts, damages, fines, costs, and the like. So if you look at this language now, a literal reading of the language does imply that there is an age qualification on which a person can no longer 
be required to be a servant, slave, or apprentice, that 21-year age. After that, our Constitution, by a literal reading of it, provides that <coughs> after a person reaches that age, they can't be bound by law to serve as a servant, slave, or apprentice. I think that is really the big issue um, that this proposal represents to address that age qualification language in the Constitution. So our 1777 Constitution has been described as being based largely on the 1776 Pennsylvania Constitution, but the PA Constitution did not have the second part regarding restrictions on a person being a servant's labor apprentice. That was added specifically by the Vermont Framers, so it wasn't borrowed from Pennsylvania. That's unique to Vermont's Constitution. Wow. This is kind of a different question, but when you refer to that being read literally, yeah. aren't there a couple competing, I guess, views about that? And you more along with yes. This? Sorry, but do you want to keep going? I don't know if you get my gist. I'm I do. Um, I'm going to talk more about the history of slavery and indentured servitude later in this document, and maybe we can have a yeah. more fuller conversation about that. And I wasn't looking to tailor it specifically yes. that, but just as far as there are some people that the constitutions are a living, breathing document, or those that feel that it should be literally interpreted. Okay, thank you. And one thing to keep in the back, when we look at a document, we, our constitution, one of the things that to look at in constitutional construction is what was happening at the time um, mm -hmm. that the language mm -hmm. was put mm -hmm. into the constitution. But we'll get to that. I have more information okay. on this in sure. the summary document. Thank you. <clears throat> So this language in Article 1 has only changed three times since 1777. Um, here, there's a link to a history of amendments to, oopsie, to our Vermont Constitution, if you want to take a look at it real quick. Um, hold on. Here it is. So here we have the original language. Here's what it look, used to look like, if you want to compare. It started out in 1777 by saying that all men are born equally free and independent. Now we use persons, we'll get to that in a minute. Um, and then provided though our rights, um, acquiring, possessing, and protecting property, enjoying, defending life and liberty, pursuing and obtaining happiness and safety. That language hasn't changed. But the language regarding slavery and indentured servitude has changed. The original language used to say, therefore, no male person born in this country or brought over from sea ought to be holden by law to serve any person as a servant, slave, or apprentice after he arrives to the age of 21 years, nor female in like manner after she arrives to the age of 18 years, unless they're bound by their own consent after they re arrive to such age or bound by law for the payments of debts, damages, fines, or costs, or the like. So you see how it started out. There's a difference in age between men and women. In our second constitution, the 1786, there was no change to this language. In the 1793 constitution, there was just a slight change in the punctuation with the therefore, uh, making it all one sentence. And then after the 1924 um, amendment to our constitution, which came after women were granted the right to vote, um, the language changed to just say, therefore, no person born in this country ought to be brought over from sea held by law to serve a person as a servant slave or apprentice after he arrives at the age of 21 years. So it eliminated the distinction in ages between men and women to say people generally um, can't be held as servant slaves or apprentice after they arrive at the age of 21. And then finally in 1994, the Supreme Court justices revised it to make that language gender neutral. So now we just have the all people language maintaining that 21 year age qualification. Rob? If, if they went, did I redirect it? Did they address some of that in 94? So 1994 was the requirement that the Vermont Supreme Court justices revise the entirety of the Vermont Constitution to make it in gender neutral language or gender inclusive. So they went to the Constitution and wherever it said he, they so would make it a gender neutral. So that was purpose yes. as opposed to, okay. Sorry. And it was not for, the, specifically the language that our Constitution says, it's not for any substantive change. It was only to make those gender neutral changes. So that 94 amendment was not substantive. Okay. 
that's a summary of how that language has changed. Um, then we get to the 13th Amendment of the U.S. Constitution, because this law always reigns supreme. Um, our 13th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution was ratified in 1865. The 13th Amendment provides that neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as a punishment for crime whereof the party shall have been duly convicted, shall exist within the United States or any place subject to the jurisdiction. I want to highlight that term, involuntary, um, involuntary servitude, versus what our Article 1 uses now, um, which talks about being a servant, slave, or apprentice. And the language, proposed language, of your proposal. Oh, I'm losing my tabs. Jim. Sorry. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> Sorry, one sec. The language of uh, your proposed um, amendment is to say indentured servitude in any form is prohibited. Um, I think there's an important difference between those two terms, involuntary servitude and indentured servitude. Um, the court, U.S. Supreme Court in 1988 discussed that not all labor that's compelled by phys physical coercion or force of law violate the 13th Amendment. The U.S. Supreme Court has stated by its terms, the amendment, the 13th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution excludes involuntary servitude imposed as a legal punishment for a crime. For example, um, the, if you're required to serve, for example, in jail, you're really not, you don't even spend any time not going there voluntarily. You're, you're involuntarily serving. Um, the court has also stated that the prohibition against involuntary servitude in the 13th Amendment doesn't prevent a state or the federal government from compelling their citizens by th threat of criminal sanction to perform civic, certain civic duties, like upholding jury service, military service, or road work. So, I think there's an important distinction between involuntary servitude generally and the language that is being proposed in Proposal 2, which is indentured servitude. And we'll get back to indentured servitude in a moment and talk about the historical use of indentured servitude at the time. Or how indentured servitude uh, was actually used in practice in the late 1700s and 1800s. This summary also goes over the history in general, very briefly, the history of slavery in Vermont. Um, there's an 1802 Vermont Supreme Court case that you have access to here that's been cited as a contemporary statement that Article I prohibited all forms of slavery. In that case, the Vermont Supreme Court stated our state constitution is express. No inhabitant of the state can hold a slave. Um, however, on the flip side, um, in testimony, this case has also been criticized um, since it was in regard specifically to a Supreme Court justice's <laughs> responsibility regarding a woman who was enslaved. Um, also, just historical research, if you uh, poke around, you can find that while the Vermont Constitution specifically prohibited slavery, um, people of color were enslaved in the state during the time, even we, though we had that language in our Vermont Constitution. Although I also have found um, in 1820 a Vermont governor's address also lamented Vermont doing, not doing more to advocate against allowing another state into the union without a provision in its constitution restricting the power of enslaving a part of a, the human family. So there was the message in our constitution and overall the our public officials statements on slavery at the time, but in practice it does seem that slavery did continue for people in this state while we had that language. Now let's get to indentured servitude. Um, getting back to that language in the Vermont Constitution that has that age qualification, that people can't be held as a servant, slave, or apprentice after they reach the age of 21 years. While we, we had that 
um, the Vermont Supreme Court in 1837 appeared to acknowledge, at least in my reading, um, that a Vermont Constitution provided an age-based restriction on indentured servitude when it was adjudicating an estate case. Um, the language in that case said that girls being more than 18 years of age could not by our law be treated as infants or minors. At common law, males and females were upon equal footing in this respect. But that section of the Bill of Rights in the Constitution of this state, which declares involuntary servitude illegal and not allowable after males arrived at the age of 21 and females at the age of 18, has always been considered fixing the age of majority of females at 18. Um, and this was a contemporaneous, contemporaneous construction with the adoption of the Constitution. Um, so in that reading, it seems to acknowledge that there was um, indentured servitude for people under for minors who didn't reach the age of majority, which at the time in 1837, well, for females was 18 and males at 21. And this is consistent with some of the research that Professor Teachout provided to you on indentured servitude. Um, he provided this handout to you um, that went through, uh, he provided his own testimony on this issue, but then he actually provided here some ads um, for workers for indentured servants. Here's a contract for indentured servitude. This is for minors. Apprentices. Here's actually a form book that he found from 1847 that presented contracts for minors to reform indentured, uh, indentured servitude. And, there, and you can look back at the history that he provided about this, where people were actually, if you wanted to come over to the US, um, you could come over on this contract that you would be working for somebody. Um, but our Constitution then said after you reach the age of majority, you couldn't be bound um, to that indentured servitude. So I think that's why there's a specific, um, a definite choice to not use the um, overall term involuntary servitude, which could include things like jury service. If you don't want to go there, you're being required involuntarily to serve versus the indentured servitude, which was the term, referencing the term at the time of what was actually happening um, with minors who were forced to work. Um, and there were even contracts for that work um, while our Constitution had that language saying that after a certain age, you couldn't be required to um, serve any person as a servant, slave, or apprentice. Trying to get back to the actual doc. For some reason, I can't find it. I'm going to have to brush up on my IT. That was an overview of what I wanted to review with you, Madam Chair. But is there anything that I didn't address that you want me to discuss? Questions, committee? Jim. So from a practical standpoint, we don't allow slavery from any age. So not changing the Constitution does not change the law in Vermont. That's correct. Um, conversely, changing it, is there anything that would, as a consequence, change practice or law in Vermont today? To not change it? To change to it. To change it? With this language, I don't think so. Okay, so you mentioned it's jury service. Correct, I mean, yes. And to emphasize what I was saying, by the use of the phrase indentured servitude, um, that's really discussing people being indentured servants, <coughs> having to work under contract against their will, under that historical phrase, indentured servitude, as it was known, um, at the, um, as it was, had been used um, at the time of this language when it was originally enacted. So, but making this change wouldn't impact, you know, call to, to 
to jury duty uh, if the draft was reinstituted, uh, Vermonters could still be drafted. Um, so none of that. So this is really a perception um, and how one looks at it, and, and I get it that it might, you know, be interpreted that at one time we allowed slavery under certain conditions um, or uh, indentured service, and we, the, the amendment would perhaps change that perception. Perception. Yes. Okay. The Vermont Supreme Court is the final interpreter of the Constitution. Yeah. So I know from, or it is my belief from my handling of this and from all the testimony to date that this is not supposed to have any sort of effect on current practice. It, would, it is not intended, as I have understood all the testimony to date, and my understanding of this is that it is not meant to have any impact on things like jury service or um, require a draft or incarceration of people when they've been adjudicated of a crime. Okay. Um, I can never say with certainty what the Vermont Supreme Court would, um, how the Vermont Supreme Court would adjudicate this, but there has been no indication from any of the testimony to date that it would have any substantive impact on the laws that currently stands. Okay, so let me pursue this a little bit. When we held a public hearing last spring, um, there was one witness, I believe, that suggested that there be no reference to slavery. Uh, just strike that section. Um, and I understand that point of view as well, that it's kind of a reminder, uh, you know, of the past that was in place at one time, but if we struck it, would there be any practical or real, not that we can, but if the Senate gave us another mm -hmm. uh, option, um, if we struck that section, would there be any practical or real um, action uh, as a result in Vermont today, Vermont law? No. Okay. So our choices are to adopt it as is, in which case, there's really no change. Or ask the Senate to give us another one and just take it all out and there'd be no change. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Also, just want to mention, going back to court interpretation, is that we've got our Vermont Supreme Court and we've got our U.S. Supreme Court. And just to reiterate that U.S. Supreme Court case that made clear that the state and federal governments can still be compelled um, to, uh, to be required to compel their citizens um, to perform certain duties. Just wanted to make, I just wanted to emphasize that our U.S. Supreme Court um, has already made that statement. Any other questions for Betsy Ann? Um, just going back to that our prior question there as far as the, the liberal interpretation. So let's just say hypothetically, and this is clearly a hypothetical, but if, if somebody had a person that was an indentured servitude to under a male under 21 now, could they literally point to that language and say it's legal? No, I mean, in today's. Yeah. No, we have uh, that it would be a crime to hold someone against their will, um, to perform labor against their will, unless it was incarceration for a jury service. Or Even though that the Constitution appears to say that, in other words, I mean it's very clear that it's illegal and it's not. It's immoral and all the other stuff. But <coughs> when not to the liberal interpretation of the language. Um, no, I don't think so. By the 13th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, it provides neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as a punishment for crime where the party has been duly convicted, shall exist in the U.S. or any place. And that within the jurisdiction. Yes. Okay. Good. Thank you. U.S. law always controls. 
questions for Betsy Ann, who knows this frontward and backward and is able to answer mm -hmm. all sorts of questions. Mm -hmm. And we very much appreciate your thorough mm -hmm. review for us mm -hmm. um, of these various documents. Um, I would love to take a few minutes here to offer time for uh, questions, discussion uh, amongst the committee um, so that we can decide uh, what we need to do in advance of an anticipated vote on this on Friday. So if anyone has uh, questions, concerns, suggestions, requests, um, or, or if you've already formed your opinion about about what we're looking at in Proposition 2. Uh, open up the floor. Jim, and then I see Rob sort of looking like he wants to say something. I'm trying to block Maybe, we can, just, yeah. <laughs> Maybe we can just go around the table, well, starting with Jim. <laughs> I have absolutely no problem with making the change, and, and I will support the issue if that's what we vote on. Um, I'm curious if you can, and it may be unfair for you to characterize it, but there was at least one dissenter in this <coughs> on the proposal because that senator felt it changed the historical um, look back of our Constitution. I'm no. not the okay. person who said that. Right. That's fine. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, Thank it, you. It, no, yes. but it sounded like um, Let me Professor see. Teachout um, initially had that same perspective, uh, but then came around as he listened to more uh, opinions and testimony on the change of fact. So. Characterizing what he said. I to us. That's I, I, I'm just changing the Constitution is a big deal. And while this on the surface seems straightforward um, and a positive thing to do, um, you know, given that people can interpret that we allow certain things at one time. Um, it may be worth, um, I think it was Senator McCormick giving him just a couple minutes of what was, why did he oppose it? Um, I mean, it's not easy to be one out of 30 um, or one out of 150 to vote differently on something. I just may be informative, that's all. I'm not saying it would change anything. I'm totally fine with the way that it is. <laughs> Mike? I agree. I'm ready to vote. This <laughs> one. I'm ready to vote right now. Marcia, questions, concerns, more information you need? Just a question, and I'm, I'm perfectly fine with this also, but. Uh, some people, constituents, have said that uh, the word slavery should be removed entirely. It should not even be present in the Constitution, Vermont's Constitution. So I wonder why, when this was written, it was included. Can you give us any? I really hesitate to try to pass on other people's perception. Didn't Professor Teachout talk about that during his presentation? If anyone can shed light on that, I appreciate it. I don't know if his presentation was also written, but I, I think he did present written testimony. He did. Might be Nelson. Yeah, I think his main point was that he thought something would be lost in history by making changes, but I think he, in the end he turned around and felt that it wouldn't be in our personal belief is the way it is kept today and stuff is nothing's lost in history. What ends up is you're changing history. You're making history by making <coughs> the changes. And I think it's, that's what we're here for 
is to do the correct thing, and if this is the correct thing, we should be voting for it. Hmm. I, I, I do understand that. I'm just asking about the one word, slavery, not the, the concept that's trying to be achieved here. Yeah, and his concern was that you're going to erase that, which... And it has, that word has a history. Yes. Okay. Thank you. John, thoughts, questions, concerns, um, opinions? No, I'm ready to vote. Um, I think with respect to, to keeping slavery and indentured servitude in the, the, the Constitution, as this proposal would do, reminds us of our history. I think it's important to remember the history of this country. That, you know, slavery and indentured servitude exist in Vermont and the country for, into the 19th century. I don't think we want to forget that. Or, you know, people... Now we're sensitive to that issue, but you know, people 100 years from now, because this is a living document, and that's it's important. The people may forget our discussions here. The only thing they'll have to go on is the Constitution. JP? Totally in favor of it, as, as proposed. Okay. We'll skip over the <laughs> empty chair. Hal? Sure. Um, I think this is an important language change uh, in our Constitution. And for some of the reasons that John, John just stated, um, and I think it's equally important that we have clarity that um, once and, and, and hopefully forever, we, we have drawn the line as a state that, uh, as we have claimed to be a state that didn't allow slavery. It's just not ambiguous anymore. And if we're going to really deal with institutional racism, we have to have a foundation in our Constitution that takes us in a different direction. So I think this is an important step for hopefully dealing with that issue as well. I'm ready to vote. Um, so we will uh, have our committee agenda reflect that Friday morning after the floor. We'll come back to this. And um, in the meantime, if you want to track down the lone senator and um, have a conversation with him, yeah. um, I not, just not hearing a great cry. I, I support um, the amendment, and it actually may be a, um, a good. Um, <coughs> compromise between taking it out altogether and those who want to preserve <coughs> some sense of history in our Constitution. Um, I, I, you know, I, I'm totally fine. I just I take our responsibility very, very seriously anytime we amend the Constitution. You know, a law we can pass and change next year, um, but not. Um, the Constitution. So um, he had a perspective. Um, quite frankly, I wouldn't have expected him to have that perspective, but he did. Um, you know, but um, you know, I maybe there's nothing to be gained. I don't know. I, I just throw it out there. All right. We will come back to this on Friday. Okay. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.